Uh, welcome back to uh, session 14 of this course. Uh, so, we'll be st uh, we will start answering the other questions of how we move from uh, different privilege levels to other, other privilege levels. What we saw so far in terms of uh, protection that X86 offers, we can go from a numerically lower privilege to a numerically higher privilege. But uh, the other part that is from a numerically higher privilege to a numerically lower privilege, we need to start answering it in great detail and, uh, and we will study that. And this particular path that we are going to address in session 14 is very important in the sense that uh, uh, this basically dictates the uh, security because this is going to talk about transitions from uh, different privilege levels to other levels. And one of the important aspects of security that we have been talking so far is uh, from the uh, privilege escalation, right? If I am going to get an undue privilege escalation, that is a vulnerability. So, from that point of view, this particular session is extremely important. So, what is task switching? When I am executing as a process, I need to store my context. So, I need to have a placeholder for my context. Why do I need a placeholder for my context? Because we are working in a system which is subject to interrupts. So, when an interrupt comes, my process has to be suspended, the interrupt has to be serviced and again my process need to start from exactly the point where I am suspended to go back. One of the very interesting example for this is basically the uh, round robin scheduling. In round robin scheduling, which the operating system performs, is a very simple stuff. There are five processes or n processes. Each process gets one time quantum. They execute. At the end of the time quantum, they are pulled out and the next process is basically given uh, uh, time to execute. So, in this context, when I am I as a process, when I am sub subjected to round robin scheduling, I will be pulled out at some point of time and again I will have to go and start executing at the same point where I have left, from the same point where I have left. Now, that means my status has to be recorded somewhere and again reloaded for me to start executing and what that status which need to be recorded so that I start again that state is actually called the context of the process. Right? So, the context is that information that one needs to store about a process so that it could be resumed back after, uh, after some time uh, from the same point where it stopped. Okay? So, the architecture actually provides uh, space which is actually used by many of the operating systems, some of the operating systems whose source code we can see, uh, we can see that they are using it. The, there is a placeholder where I can store my context and that placeholder is called a task state segment TSS. Right? So, with this as a background, let us just go through this slide that I have put on the screen. Every process has an associated task state segment whose starting point is stored in the task register. So, task state segment is something like 104 bytes where I store all the information that is necessary for me to restart again. And where that task state segment is stored in the memory, in the operating system part of the memory typically and it is pointed to the start of the task state segment that 104 bytes where it is stored. We need to know the start of that segment and that is stored in the task register. Like how I have a global descriptor table register which stores the starting point of the global descriptor table, how I have a local descriptor table register which stores the starting point of a local descriptor table, how I have uh, a, a CR3 register which stores the starting address of the page directory. Like this, I also have a task register which stores the starting address of my task state segment. So, 
when I am going to move out, what will happen? I store all the, the architecture, not, not the program, the architecture by itself stores all the contents of different registers, etc., into that task state segment. It dumps it there and then it pulls me out. Next time when I want to come from that task state segment, it will load all the registers. So, I start executing from the point I left. Okay? Right? So, a task switch that is from one process to another process happens due to a jump or call instruction, right? whose segment selector points to a star state segment descriptor, which in turn points to the base of a new star state segment. So, we will now go through this second part of the line, which is very, very important from uh, a security perspective. Okay. Now, let us understand what a star state segment is. As I told you, it has something like 104 bytes. 0 to 104 and note that there are several things here, many things you will immediately follow, many things you may take some time to follow. What are the things here? All the general purpose registers starting from 40 to 68 as you see here, EAX, EBX, ECX, EDX, ESP, EBP, ESI, EDA. Then your flags register, when you just complete execution, what was your flag register? then your instruction pointer, which instruction are you currently executing? So, that I have to start, uh, uh, which instruction you have to execute next? So, that when I go out and I restart, I have to start from that instruction. So, EAP, then CR3, right? CR3 is the control register which stores the start of a page directory. Please note, when we go and study the operating systems, many of the modern operating systems give a separate page direct paging mechanism for every process, right? For every process, we will have its own page directory, right? And I switch from one process to another, my page directory will also change, right? Right? So, we will, we will just leave it at this point, but please have it in your mind that whenever you attend the next level course on operating system, please understand that every process will get its own page directory, right? But we will not go beyond that, then it becomes much into the operating system today. But we also store the starting address of a page directory then, right? So, these are all the uh, stuffs here. Now, on top of it, you have ES, SS, CS, DS, FS, GS. These are all the segment selectors for your different stored in your different segment registers. So, the content of your segment registers are already stored in this, right? So, when I move from, when I am pulled out, the current values of all my general purpose registers, the current value of my flag register, the next instruction that I need to execute the current page directory, start of the page directory which I am using, the current values of, of all the segment registers are all dumped here. Do you understand this? Correct? And then there is an LDT segment selector because I, I can have my own LDT, right? So, that LDT segments, I will come to LDT segment selector slightly later, but I have my own LDT. Let us even assume that I need the base address of that LDT. That also is stored here. Right? Okay. Do you get all these things? We will not go on to IO map base address. That is something that again we will try and do uh, beyond operating systems course. Okay. But are you able to understand say from byte 28 to byte 96? Is there any doubt? So, all these things are about my process and all those values are immediately dumped here, automatically by the architecture. In addition, please understand that there are three more stacks, SS0, SS1, SS2 and three stack pointers, ESP0, ESP1 and ESP2. And then there is a previous task link, this is basically if I do nested task switching, the link will be established. So, I, 
So if you study uh, normally the operating system course, right? If you if you if you have taught that course or if you are studying that course, there will be something like uh, a process control block, which stores the context of the process, and they will be in one linked list. This previous task link will sort of establish that linked list for you. Can establish that linked list. It is up to the operating system to utilize it. Correct. So now, why I need three different stacks and three different stack pointer values here? What is SS zero? It is pointing to a. This is a segment selector pointing to some stack descriptor. SS1 is again some segment selector pointing to some stack descriptor, similarly SS2 and ESP0, ESP1, ESP2 are the values of the stack pointer again stored here. Why I need this? This has lot of security implications. When, did st when we talked about stack smashing, right, that vulnerability happened because we shared a stack and we shared a stack and the vulnerability actually became very problematic because the called calling routine was at a higher privilege than the called routine, meaning numerically lower privilege. Correct? So when the called called routine, I went and filled up my own mal malicious program and changed the return address. Where did I do it? On the stack. Right? And when I when I went back to the, when I gave a return, then what happened? The called, called, calling routine which is which was at a higher privilege started executing that and it started executing my program at its privilege and that is why I was able to get into the system. Do you remember yesterday's class? Okay, This is what exactly happened. Now all these things happen because I am using stack, the same stack. The same stack is used by the codes of two different privilege levels, correct? The calling program was at a different privilege level than the called program. Now the called program went and wrote, wrote all its malicious code in the stack and it returned back and the calling program essentially started executing this malicious code at its privilege. So the vulnerability is because two privilege levels are sharing the same stack, right? To get rid of this, XI6 gives you a wonderful opportunity here. Note that if I am a privileged level 3 code and I am calling a privileged level 2 code, calling in the sense that I may do a, there can be an interrupt, right, or I can do through a, there can, mostly there can be an interrupt, right. The interrupt is the most important thing. When there is an interrupt, immediately your interrupt service routine might be in privilege 2 or it can be in privilege 1 or it can be in privilege 0. When the interrupt service routine is in privilege 2, it will not use the stack of my, my stack. It will start using the stack which is given by SS2 and ESP2. SS2 is the stack segment, ESP2 is the stack pointer. So, when the interrupt service routine is of privilege 2, it will start using SS2 and ESP2 and it will not touch me. If it is using my own stack, after the interrupt service routine comes back, there is a chance that I can use that stack values and see if there was something happening there. The interrupt service can do something very confidential, correct? And those confidential information can leak through the stacks, you are getting that? So, when I am a process of privilege level 3 and my interrupt service is happening at privilege level 2, my stack will not be used. The stack of that, the SS2, ESP2 will be used. If it is going to be privilege 1, SS1, ESP1 will be used. SS1 will store the offset into the segment descriptor table, uh, into, into the, the, the descriptor table from which I will get the base address, etc. Right? And this is the so I will now define a stack segment by that SS1 will describe a stack segment. Right? It is a selector, it goes to a descriptor table, there will be a descriptor, from there there is a base address limit everything for the stack segment. And ESP1 is the stack pointer to the stack segment. You are getting this? Right? When I go to, when my privilege, when, when my interrupt service routine is at privilege 0, then it will use SS0 and ESP0. So, 
two codes of two privileged levels will not share the same stack and by this some major vulnerabilities can be avoided right so when i as an operating system i ask uh, so uh, when when i uh, when a process comes to me saying yes i want to execute so what are the things i will do i will create a code segment i will create a data segment i will create stack segment i will create ldt right and all i'll i'll also create a task state segment like this right and i will also populate this ss0 esp0 ss1 esp1 ss2 esp2 i will also fill up this eip with the start address where i have loaded the program and then give control to the program so it will start executing whenever this is being pulled out immediately what will happen the entire context would be saved in this thing so that i could restart whenever i want to restart this program. you are getting this you are, you are able to appreciate how task switching happens the most important thing in this task switching is from a security perspective it is very important that there are different stacks assigned to every process and if i want an interrupt service routine of a different privilege to service a process which is of other different privilege i need not share the stack the architecture itself please understand this is the architecture related to security the architecture itself will see that it will switch the stack you use some different stack rather than this and that will give us lot more uh, protection in terms of uh, isolation right are you getting this so this is why yesterday stack smashing the, the stack smashing that i thought in different uh, previous sessions are very 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 important right right so you you appreciate from that point of view even though stack smashing may not happen now there could be lot more uh, important uh, 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 security measures that are put to get rid of stack smashing today but still as an example it worked good because this explains many of these concepts here okay <coughs> so now what is this task state segment how can we handle it so let us take a few minute uh, 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 for this and we will talk about this okay <coughs> there are as as i told you there are different types of descriptors in a descriptor table right so i also told you there could be something called a user descriptor and a system descriptor correct this task state segment it is a segment so there will be a descriptor which is describing this test segment correct and that is called a task state segment descriptor okay and that is a system descriptor okay now this is how it looks like please look there is a gdt in the gdt there is a tss descriptor that will point to the start of a task state segment what is a task state segment this is the task state segment the starting point of this will be pointed out by a descriptor which can be part of your gdt alone it cannot be part of your ldt a task state segment descriptor can be only in a gdt right now there could be something called task gates which will point to this tss descriptor right this task gate can be in your ldt it can be in your gdt it can also be in your interrupt descriptor table i'll we'll shortly talk about interrupt interrupts very shortly so your task gate can be in your ldt it can be in your gdt or idt let me say that your task gate is at some Uh, third location here so how do i do task switching i just say jump 0 x 10 right so 0 x 10 is the second descriptor so this is the second descriptor when i say jump 0 x 10 in a gdt or whatever when i jump on this task gate when i jump when i execute jmp with 
with with this selector as the number. So, this is the third 0 1 second selector right. If I say jump 2 colon whatever I do not 2 colon I can have any random value. The moment I say jump 2 colon that means it is going to come and see what is the second selector in your GDT or LDT correspondingly. So, when I see that I go and realize that it is a task gate. The moment I realize that it is a task gate, I know that there is going to be a task switch. That means I am going to be pulled out and something else is going to happen. The moment there is a task gate, that task gate will point to a TSS descriptor. That TSS descriptor will point to a TSS. You followed? Now, I as a process who is executing, there is a process A who is executing jump to colon, do not care. My process, there is a TR for me, right? task register for me. That task register will be storing what? My task gate's value. See, my task gate can be in say sixth location here. And my TSS descript that will point to another TSS descriptor here, which will be another TSS here. So, what happens is whatever is available in this TSS descriptor will be loaded before, uh, after whatever is there in my context will be loaded into this TSS, the, the, the older TSS descriptor and this new TSS descriptor content will be loaded into the uh, uh, registers. Okay? I am sure I have not explained it fully. So, I will again do it uh, step by step. So, I am process A and I have, I am executing and I am executing jump to colon do not care. The 2 corresponds to the second entry in the LDT or GDT. Okay? Let us say it is the LDT that 2 is a task gate. Moment it is a task gate, I know that I am going to be switched out and the new process is going to start executing. So, that 2 is that descriptor here is pointing to a task state segment descriptor. This task gate is pointing to a task state segment descriptor, correct? This task state segment descriptor will point to a task state segment. So, the moment I say jump to colon whatever do not care, it will come to this, the architecture will come to this TSS descriptor, will come here and it will load the content of this TSS into my, into the corresponding uh, parts of your architecture. For example, TSS will have EAX, the value of the EAX stored here, right? This is also store EAX, right? So, what will this store? EAX, EBX, all these values, it will all be loaded into the corresponding EAX, EBX, ECX, ETX. SS, all these segment selectors will be loaded. Note that EIP is also there. So, the instruction to be executed that will also be loaded, right? And then this program will start executing, correct? And there is a task register. The task register, what will be the value now? It will be 2 the new value of the task register will be 2. You followed? You got it? So, when I say jump to colon do not care, it comes to this second descriptor here, it finds that it is a task gate, immediately it knows there is going to be a task switch, who the architecture will know, immediately it will go, this task gate will point to a task state segment descriptor, then it will go to the task state segment descriptor and it will load the content of the new process completely including the instruction pointer which is which will tell you which instruction you have to execute. That is why I said jump to colon do not care because whatever I put there it has no value. What, this EAP whatever EAP is there that will be loaded and the new process will start executing and your task register will store now the value 2. Right? Right? So, before doing all these things what will my old process, what will the task register be there for the old process? See, I am a process, 
I am executing 2 colon something, right? And when 2 colon something is executed, immediately the new process starts executing in the manner. Before executing that 2 colon, right? The jump 2 colon, what would be my status? I am another task. I would have had another task register, task register value. That task register value will be pointing to what? Some other task gate, some other task state segment descriptor there. So, the moment I realize that this is 2 colon something, the moment I realize that this is a task gate, immediately I will go to my task register, I will find out where my task state segment is available, I will go and dump my values completely and then fresh, this values will be loaded fresh. Okay? And all these things are taken care by the program, by the architecture. Right? So, when the architecture, so I am a process A, I am executing jump to colon something, I go to this 2, I find it is a task gate that is architecture finds it is a task gate. The moment it finds that it is a task gate, immediately it will go to the task register, it will find out where the task state segment of that process is, the old process, it will take all the values of the different registers etcetera and dump into the task state segment, then come to this two, go to this TSS descriptor, go and find all these task state segment here and then load it into the into the registers now and start executing the process. And by this what happens? I have done a task switch from one level to the another level. Do you all understand this? Right? So, I have a task gate, then a TSS descriptor, then I go to TSS. So, there is two levels of transition that I need to do before I do the context switch. Do you understand this? That is why when you when you study operating systems in the, uh, many of the books, you see that thread switching is much faster than process switching. Right? There is a statement that is put right, thread switching is much faster than process switching. Right? Why? This is one of the reasons, because at least I need to go through multiple levels of thing. First, that task register should find that task gate and that task segment, uh, segment selector and then that task state segment, put all the contents there, then again come to the new task gate, come to the new TSS descriptor, get the new values, load it and then start executing it. So, so many things have to happen before a task switch essentially takes place and all these are supported by the architecture and that is why task switch is faster than if everything has to be done by software, it becomes much slower. You are getting this? Yes or no? Followed? Okay. Now, the same thing is about interrupt. See, there are two types. So, interrupts are of, so we call a generic name called exceptions. Exceptions means something that should not happen that in the normal course of the program and that has happened. So, that is why it is called an exception. Uh, the literal word meaning of exception also is valid here. Exceptions are of two kinds. One is called trap, another is called interrupt. Right? Trap is I fall into a trap means I do some nonsense and I fall into it. So that is what I call it as a trap. Interrupt means somebody else is stopping me. So, a process or a program in execution can stop executing due to two reasons. Reason number one, I do something which I should not have done and I fall. For example, divide by 0 or segment over, the, over uh, uh, stack overflow or st segment overflow, right. All these things I am not supposed to do, but I have done it. So, this is an trap. So, I fall into my own trap. There can be some timer interrupt coming, right or some other peripheral interrupt coming, which is I am not responsible for it. So, those are called interrupts. So, generic name for 
exception uh, for, for uh, that these type of things is called ex the generic name is exception and the generic name is divided into two parts one is trap another is interrupt trap is something that the program does to get it out right if i divide by zero i am thrown out segmentation overflow i am thrown out page fault i am thrown out right stack overflow i am thrown out double fault i am thrown out for many many reasons you will be thrown out alignment check fault i am thrown out right on the other hand I get an interrupt from an external source like a keyboard interrupt or a timer interrupt. Those are called as interrupts. Okay? So, exceptions are of two types, traps that are generated by the program, interrupts that are external to the program. Okay? Now, for some reason the literature says everything has interrupts. Okay? Inter interrupts include traps and interrupts. Okay? Now, how is the interrupt handled? It is exactly handled like uh, like the other uh, descriptors, the many of the or almost all the contemporary architecture have something called vectored interrupts. What is vector interrupts? For every interrupt there is a number assigned to it. So, there are 255 possible interrupts that you can define and some are already defined. That is, so this forms a vector of size. Uh, 0 to 255 or 256 or 0 to 255 and each number in that corresponds to some interrupt. Okay. The 0 to 31 is already defined by the architecture. For example, 0 is divided by 0, okay. 2 is debug, 7 or 8 is double fault, 8 is double fault I think, 7 is some stack fault, 13 is general protection fault, 11 or 12 is page page fault. So, all these things are some of them are already defined by the architecture. Beyond 32 to 255 you can define your interrupts. For example, I add a peripheral device for the peripheral device I will give a series of interrupts. So, if I come through those interrupts that I know that the interrupt is coming from that peripheral device. So, I know which device driver should I use for a given interrupt correct. So, for a keyboard there is a keyboard device driver for a graphics card graphics card device driver PCI express PCI device. For different uh, devices, I will have my dif different device driver numbers. Okay, so the so the interrupt. So if I have say 255 interrupts or 256 interrupts, for in every interrupt, I should know where the interrupt service routine is located, and what is the privileged level in which that interrupt service routine will execute. Okay, I need to know that. So that is given in what you call as this interrupt descriptor table. In the interest descriptor table, they will tell you there are two things. One thing is it will tell you, hey, this is the code segment. It will give you a selector for a code segment. Go and execute this code segment. That means, go and execute the tenth segment in the uh, GDT or the tenth segment. Mostly LDT may not be used, but you can use LDT also. But tenth segment in the GDT, right? 10th code segment in the GDT. So, it will tell you one segment selector which points to a code segment. Then it will give you an offset within that code segment. So, go and ex start executing from that offset from that code segment and it will also give you a privilege level. <coughs> okay? That code will have a privilege level. So, if I am going to execute some, something which is not, uh, so, so I am a privilege level 3 code and the interrupt service is going to be a privilege level 1 code. Then what will happen? Importantly, <coughs> the stack will change. The stack 1, ESP 1 will be used today. Okay? So, that is the most important thing. So, so, I will generate an interrupt. That interrupt can be divided by 0 means the 0th interrupt. So, I will go into the 0th location in your IDT. That will give me one code segment and that will also give me an offset within that code segment. So, I go to that code segment and I look at that offset from there I will start executing it. Similarly, if I generate uh, say I did it 1 interrupt 1. So, this is the, the so first entry in your uh, first the 0 first no the second entry will be. Second entry into your IDT will give me a code segment from which I will get the base. And it will, the, the same thing will also give me an offset. So, from that offset I will start executing. 
So, when I generate an interrupt, I go to a different code segment and start executing from some offset within that code segment. And if that code segment is of a different privilege than me, there will be a ta stack that is switched. So, that there is now some amount of security that I bring in here. In addition, I can also start a new process itself. If I put a task gate here, then there will be a context switch. In the previous thing, what I told you, it is only a stack switch, but then the interrupt service routine is essentially working like a function, it is working like a function call and after that you return back and you start executing your own process. But in some cases, I will do a complete task switch. So, the interrupt service routine is a, is a complete new task. It will finish and if you want, it will come back to this older task. You got this point? So, <coughs> so when, I, when I generate an interrupt, I can handle the interrupt service routine like a function call. That means, my context is still, still there. The interrupt service routine will work in my context. With, but, but with different stack in, in, in case where the privilege levels are different and then it will return back to me and I will start executing. So, my context is not stored somewhere and retrieved back, you are getting my point, right. So, that is how I, I, I handle interrupt service routine like a function call, but I can also in, handle interrupt service routine like a task switch where completely I move off and a new task starts executing, the interrupt service routine is not a function, but it is a new task by itself and then after the task finish, it may call me or it may not call me, correct. Now, so in the IDT, the inter inter interrupt descriptor table, we will be actually implementing this in the lecture, then you many things will become much more clearer, but for our understanding, inside, inside the IDT, there are two types of uh, uh, you know, entries. Entry number one is an interrupt gate. It is called an interrupt gate. What will the interrupt gate do? It will just treat that interrupt like a function call. It can also be a task gate as shown in this figure in which it will treat this as a complete context switch. So, when an interrupt comes depending upon for that interrupt, so every interrupt has a number 0 to 255 depending on that entry in the interrupt descriptor table, if it is going to be an interrupt gate, then what will happen? I will just treat this interrupt like a function call. If it is going to be a task gate, then I am going to treat this interrupt like a task context switch. One very simple example of uh, interrupt gate is that when I do a printf, for example, then it is like a function call. But please note that I am going to an operating system routine, it is not my routine, it's, it is at a different level, right. But if, if the scheduler is going to pull me out but due to a timer interrupt, then it is going to be a complete context switch because a new process is at the end of this interrupt, I may not even come back to execution, somebody else will come into execution. So, it can become a context switch, right. So, there are two ways by which interrupts are handled, okay. So, so, with this as a background, let us just go and uh, see this slide. In the interrupt handling, processor actually generates interrupts that index into an interrupt descriptor table. So, please note that every interrupt has an integer value and when the processor generates this interrupt, that actually index into an interrupt descriptor table. And I should know, index means I should know where the base is. So, the base is stored in a register called IDTR, which is interrupt descriptor table register and the way I can load that IDTR, I have to initialize that value to point to the base of the interrupt descriptor table. The way I load that IDTR is using a privileged instruction called LIDT, right. Like how I had LGDT, LLDT, I have now LIDT which will load that particular value into the interrupt descriptor table register, okay. 
The descriptors in the IDT can be of two types. Type number one is called an interrupt gate in which the interrupt service routine handled like a normal call subroutine and it uses the interrupted processor stack to save all your EAP, CS uh, and SS ESP in case of stack switch, new, new stack is got from the task state segment. I also explained what a stack switch is and why it, it should happen, right. Your interrupt service routine is at a different privilege level than the actual uh, process that is executing while the interrupt was coming. Essentially, there will be a stack switch. If the next type of a descriptor inside an IDT can be a task gate, if it is a task gate, your interrupt service routine is handled like a task switch, okay. So, for example, uh, if I have a stack overflow at privilege level 0, right, I cannot use an interrupt service routine there please understand. For that, I need to have a task gate to handle this particular scenario. Why? I am a PL level 0 code, right, and there is a stack fault, stack is overflowing. I need to have a double fault handler here. I need to do an entire stack switch. I need to do it, I cannot handle it using an interrupt gate, I need a task gate, why? I repeat the question, there are two types of descriptor in the IDT, one is an interrupt gate and a task gate, why do we need task gate? Why do we need interrupt gate? That is almost clear. Task gate, I said that the complete interrupt service routine is handled like a task switch, it, the interrupt service routine will become a new task by itself. And this is needed for stack fault, meaning stack overflow fault, when your privilege level is 0. Okay. So, the first question, first, yes, very good. So, the first thing is, when I am at privilege level 0 and I have a stack fault, but the stack is overflowing, first and foremost, you are uh, the stack switch will never happen because you are already in privilege level 0, so it will not take another privilege level 0 stack. So, it will start using your own stack. And if you are, if you are going to have an interrupt gate to handle this, then what will happen? This fellow, the, as, because of this uh, for interrupt, more things will be tried to push into the same stack. Because what will happen in the interrupt gate? ISR handled as a normal call subroutine uses the interrupted processor stack to save EAP, CS, etc. You got this? So, what will happen? I am having a privilege 0 code, I have a stack overflow, right, and I put only an interrupt gate there, then what happens? Huh? Uh, more things will be pushed into this stack and that will cause more overflow. So, this is actually called a double fault. See, double fault is not that when an interrupt service routine itself is creating another fault. When I am switching, see, when I am switching from the normal routine to the interrupt service routine in that process, I am switching. At the, while switching, I do lot of things. For example, I push something into the stack, etc. When I am doing that process, in my movement from a normal process to the interrupt service routine, in that in between, if again some fault occurs, then it is called a double fault, right. In this case, it is going to happen. If I have an interrupt gate there and I am a privilege level 0 and I have a stack overflow, what will happen? I will start pushing, if I have an interrupt gate, I will start pushing more things into the stack which will create another overflow. Even before I start executing the interrupt service routine, I will create another fault and that is why it is called a double fault. It is not a nested fault, it is a double fault because nested fault is something, I will come to nested faults. Now, I cannot handle, now this double fault, if again it goes on to a stack fault, then it will again create one more fault, then this will go into an infinite loop, right. You got this, 
the hardware will go into an infinite loop. It is not the software creating an infinite loop. Please understand here. It is the hardware itself will go into an infinite loop. It will not go and it has no way of executing the next instruction at all. You got this? There is a very subtle difference between a software infinite loop and this infinite loop. So, so what we need to do is when a privilege level 0 gets into a stack fault, I cannot use the stack anymore. So, I need to go and do a complete contest switch to disown that process and talk, start my known ISR to go and find out why this calamity has happened. <coughs> okay. So, that is one simple example <coughs> where ISR where a task gate should be a part of your IDT. You are able to follow this, right? If I have an interrupt gate, it would have landed up in a exception. Now, last several years in several uh, interviews or selection of students, or I have been asking what is a double fault. The answer I get, sir, when the interrupt service routine is executing, the interrupt service routine generates an exception, then it is a double fault. No, it is not a double fault, right? When I am moving from the normal routine to the interrupt service routine, interrupt service routine is yet to execute its first instruction. When in the process of movement, I generate a fault, then it is called a double fault. I go to the interrupt service routine and it starts executing. When it is executing, some other instruction creates a fault, then it becomes a nested fault. It is treated like a normal fault. You got it? So, this is a subtle difference between a double fault and a uh, nested fault. Okay? It is not an interrupt service routine while it is executing creates another interrupt that is not double fault. When I am moving from the normal routine to the interrupt service routine, at that point when I create another fault, then it is a double fault and one example for that is given here. You got it? Now, I told that there can be 255 interrupts in which the first 32, 0 to 31 are used by machine and they are reserved. 32 to 255 are user definable. That is for every peripheral you can define an interrupt. Okay? And then there are advanced programmable interrupt controllers uh, which you can study. So, there is a lot of architecture that can go into how to handle interrupts quickly. And for especially real time systems, you need these interrupts to be very fast in response. So, there are a lot of interrupt controllers that are basically in hardware to see that this becomes very fast. So, that is another aspect of architecture. Okay. Now, in terms of this interrupt handling, the first 32 are reserved by the machine and these are quite important for us to note because if at all I am going to catch a vulnerability. right? I need to capture it using interrupts. Please understand that. So, 0 is divide error uh, and it goes to the first descriptor in the IDT. Right? The kth fault will be kth descriptor. So, if I have a divide error, what should I do? The hardware will first take, it will find it is 0. It will, hardware will go to the first entry in the IDT and what will be there in the first entry in the IDT? It will give you a code segment and a offset. So, it will go and start executing that and that will take, it will just print divide by 0 and it will exit the program. Okay? That printing divide by 0 is done by an interrupt service routine corresponding to the divide by 0 uh, fault. Okay? 1 is debug, 8 is double fault, 2 to 6 are reserved, 2 to 7, 12 is tax segment fault, 13 is general protection fault, 14 is page fault. So, these are all some of the uh, 32 faults that are defined by the machine. Okay? So, what we have seen here in general is about task switching in which I can, I can switch from any privilege level to any other privilege level, but to switch I, I need to do, I need to go through several checks and balances, I need to have, I need to go through a task gate, I need to go through a TSS descriptor and uh, Similarly, for the interrupt, I may handle it directly or I can go through a task gate which goes through a TSS descriptor and then it go, it essentially performs a task switch. Right? So, 